41 verse 10. Isaiah 41 verse 10. And it reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Our song for today is more than ever before. Lord, I need you. confessing our sins for we know that you are the sin breaker you realize father god that we have to come to you for forgiveness of sin god we've fallen short we messed up lord we've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight now lord we ask you to forgive us bless our lives bless us to hear your word Lord, we ask you, Father God, to let nothing stop us from hearing from you tonight. 
Bless your word to go forth with strength, power, and conviction. That lives will be made to better. That we will be strengthened. And that we will tell men, women, boys, and girls about this God that we serve. That he's changing lives. That he's keeping us whole. That he's giving us a new walk and a new talk. Lord, bless us to tell men, women, boys, and girls about the saving power of Jesus Christ. Bless us to remember the message that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. And bless us to deliver that message that he is coming back and he's coming to get those who have given their lives to him. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Jesus says that my house will be called the house of prayer. And we ought to pray in his house. Amen? Amen. We ought to pray in his house and we ought to make sure that we keep his house the house of prayer. Hallelujah. We're on day three, page 17 in your booklet. We're on day three. Day three. We have some long days in the Experiencing God book, don't we? Some long days, a whole seven weeks. We are on day three. Probably, probably eight, nine weeks. We are on day three. But we we don't want to get in a hurry. We just want to do what God has for us to do, and that's learn His word. Amen? Amen. Last week we talked about the first reality is the fact that God is at work. God is at work all around us. What is our responsibility? To join, to join God when He's at work, right? We look for where God is at work. We seek to see where God is at work. We scan out our atmosphere to see where God is at work. Now, we've been talking about God being at work, so how do we tell <laughs> when God is at work? How do we tell when he's at work? Is it only when he blesses us? He's at work all the time. Okay, we know he's at work all the time, right? So if he's at work all the time, and we have to join him where he's already at work, we ought to be looking for him and see where he's at work. But how do we tell when God is at work? How do we tell where God is at work? The first reality is God is always at work all around us. And as he's at work all around us, we got to join him where he's at work. Do we tell he's at work because we get a new car, new house, get an increase on our paycheck? Is that when we know God is at work? Here. <laughs> Being here, we know God. <laughs> we, we still here. Right. You, you, you sound like we don't have to be here. <laughs> no, we don't we have, have to be here. here. No, we we could have been gone. The quartet singer says it like this, I should have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but God, you made on death behave. Said he could have been dead. So one way we know that God is still at work, we, we're still here. We're still here. But have you thought about it since we started this, this particular study? How do we know that God is at work? How do we find out where he's at work? Since we know he's at work, how do we find out he's at work? We have to have a relationship with him and being close to him and read his word. So first of all, we must have a relationship. So in order to have a relationship, we have to be saved. We have to be born again. <laughs> you know, people will always tell you that we are all children of God. And that's correct. But when we say that we are children of God, are we talking about the fact that all of us are children of God? Because all of us are children of God because God made us. 
But when we talk about being a child of God and being a part of these children of God that God has, are we talking about the fact that God made all of us? Yes? No? Maybe so. I see it. Explain to me. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Okay. So when we talk about when when Christians, Christians talk about the children of God, we're talking about those who have decided to follow him, those who believe his word, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. That's what we mean when we say that we are the children of God. So we must have a relationship. In order to have a relationship, we must be born again. What are we talking about when we say born again? Who's talking? Believe in the story. Hmm? Believe in the story. Believing in the story that a train ran into a car on the way here. That's the story? No. What story are we believe in? I believe that uh, that we know that we have learned that God, uh, that Jesus went to the cross, died on Calvary for our sins, and but he rose again. Okay. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. Amen? So that we believe that story, but what do we believe about it? We believe it's that story and that story alone that will get us to heaven. Jesus died once and for all. First Peter says it like this. In First Peter chapter 3, he says that Jesus died the only one who died, he died once for all. And Jesus died for everybody. And he only had to die one time. We don't have to keep crucifying Jesus. We have to crucify ourselves. Crucify our mindsets. Crucify our hearts. Paul says that I die daily to myself. That I will live through Christ Jesus. So we got to look and see where God is at work. Watch to see what God is working. Join him where he's at work. God is always at work around us. That's how we closed out um, day two, unit one. We got to watch to see. Has anybody seen what God is at work lately? Since we began this study, have you begun to look at what God is doing in a more in-depth way? Anybody? Anybody? And myself, I see that uh, it has empowered me more to study and know the word more. Okay, so the study has empowered us. And as we are empowered by the word of God, we understand that God has the last word. One thing that we learned on last week is that we need to be asking God, God, what is your will? And for years, we've been asking God, God, what is your will for my life? We want to do and be about God's will. And when we ask, what is God's will? And we're asking it to God, we want to get on the same page that God is on. We want to know God's will. That's why Jesus says, when you pray, you ask, G you ask God, let your will be done. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Then you go and ask, give me some daily bread. One guy, one guy made fun of me. He said that uh, whenever I stand on Sunday and I ask people to come and give their lives to Christ, and then after I ask for salvation, the next thing I, I say, those of us who have sinned needs repentance. He says that what I'm really doing is I messed up all week myself and I'm confessing. He says that because I messed up, the Holy Spirit has come upon me. And now I'm confessing my sin before the whole congregation. And because I'm confessing my sin before the whole congregation, now I feel convicted. The text declares, Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned. 
You sin in your thoughts. You sin in your mind. You sin in your conversation. You sin in your deeds. We all sin. And guess what? We're going to have this burden to Jesus shows back up. When Jesus cracks the sky, the Bible teaches that he's coming to get a church without a spot or a wrinkle. And guess what? It's going to be instant that our spots and wrinkles will disappear. Because before he shows up, the second before, the moment before he shows up, we still have spots and wrinkles. Anybody in the room got a spot or a wrinkle? Just one thing, just one little hidden secret that you're going to keep to yourself. Those are spots and wrinkles. And you're going to have it until Jesus gets back. Day three is where we are now. We're learning to be a servant of God. The entire day is focused on being a servant of God. We have some readers. I don't remember in order that you're supposed to come, but we're going to do the first two paragraphs on page 17, and we're going to do the scriptures and the questions. First two readers are coming. The first reader will take all the scriptures and read it to us, and then the second person will read the printed text on page number 17. We're going to learn how to be a servant of God. We serve, right? We serve on our job. We serve in our church. But we want to know how to be a servant of God. And the author oftentimes uses a play on words. And you're going to see that play on words. Like last week, he talked about we need to ask God for God's will. And we've been asking God for God's will for our lives. So you're going to see that happening in day three also. First person is going to read three passages of scripture. The first passage is Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight. The second passage is Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. And the third passage is John 20 and 21. Philippians two, five to that mic, get closer to it, all right. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. John 20 and 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Thank you. First two Many scripture passages describe Jesus as God's servant. He came as a servant to accomplish God's will to redeem humanity. Here's what Paul said about Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, emphasis added. In his instructions to his disciples, Jesus, the Son of Man, described his own role of servanthood this way. 
Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Jesus also identified what our relationship with him should be like. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. John 20 and 21. Thank you. We're going to look at the questions 1, 2, and 3 on page um, 17. Based on these scriptures, question one, based on these scriptures and others, are you comfortable with having the identity of being a servant of God? Okay. Yes. Number two. Okay. okay. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Briefly describe a time when you gave your best effort for God, but felt frustrated that little or no lasting fruit resulted. Mm -hmm. Number three, what is a servant? Define servant in your own words. Okay. okay, let's talk about these questions. First of all, when we look at the first two paragraphs, it's related, the first paragraph is related to Philippians chapter two. And we know Philippians chapter two talks about the fact that Jesus thought, in the King James Version, it says Jesus thought it not robbery that he was not to be to be equal to God. In other words, Jesus was in heaven, in his heavenly place. And as he was in heaven, someone had to bridge the gap between God and man. Man was messed up. Noah had already uh, built the ark. The family was saved. Noah and his family were saved on the ark. Why did God destroy the world? Because man was messed up. Because man was sinful. Yeah. A flood came, lasted 40 days. Noah and his family was, were saved. And guess what? The world went back, back to messing up. When the world started being populated again, guess what happened? Man ran back to sin. Even Noah, the, even Noah who was fair, got sloppy drunk. I mean sloppy drunk. I mean tissy drunk. Yes. So man has this nature. Man has this desire to sin. And those who say they don't have a desire, that's sin there. Those who look down at other folk, that's sin there. So man has this ongoing desire to sin because we have a sin nature. Regardless of how saved you are. Regardless of how many church services you go attend. Regardless of how often you go to BTU. Do they have those anymore? Regardless of how many Bible studies you go to. How many Sunday school classes. Regardless if you are a teacher or a pupil. We have sin nature in us. What that says is our natural man loves to sin. We don't want to admit it. How many of you go a place, let's just say a wedding reception, and they played all Christian music in the church service. But when you get to the reception, they, the, 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 the DJ let the pastors know when it's time to go. He doesn't have to say a word. He just put on, he, he, he eases into it. He, he goes from, from Christian music, and always start with Christian music and a prayer. The preacher is there, his wife is there, his family is there. It's always a good time. They, and by the time they have the first dance, the beat changes. And I, there's nothing wrong with music. You ought to be, be so in tune with music that you can know what you need to pat your foot to and what you don't need to pat. 
Now it's hard to determine in the 21st century what music you listen to. You have to put it on slow. Like a 33, how many of y'all know what a 33 album is? One, two, three, How many of y'all know what a 45 is? Oh my goodness. Y'all been Christian a long time. How many of y'all know what CDs are? I got almost everybody. <laughs> How many of y'all know what a jump drive is? A SD card. Yep. When they get to that point in the reception, they start off with something like the electric slide. You know it's getting ready to get wild. You hear the DJ say, oh, oh. And the moment he said, oh, People start coming out the woodwork. It doesn't matter who they're talking to. It doesn't matter what the conversation is about. The DJ, the, the, the record says, oh. I mean, people start, even Sister Davis, patting her feet in there. <laughs> oh. It's about to get live. It's about to get wild. And, and guess what? Every now and then, you will catch yourself patting your feet. Because we are rhythm, rhythm, people of rhythm, right? And because we are people of rhythm, we like the beat, we like the rhythm. So when just because you are saved doesn't mean that you don't enjoy the rhythm anymore. I didn't forget what I used to do. I just had to stop doing it. Yes? So as a, as a servant of God, Jesus humbled himself to be a servant. We talked about the hypostatic union. Brother Whitlock, what's the hypostatic union? Hypostatic union. It's when Jesus is fully God and fully man. When Jesus is fully God and fully man. It is the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus is man. And he's not God and man at a different time. It reveals itself at a different time, but he's still God in the flesh and he's God in the spirit. The hypostatic union. When you look at Philippians chapter two, Jesus who is God came down and look what it says. Jesus was as God's servant. The many, many passages describe Jesus as God's servant. He came as a servant to accomplish the redemptive work of humanity. Meaning he came to redeem humanity. He came to deliver human beings from their sin. He came to redeem us. Redeem means to buy us back. And I like to say not only did he buy us back, he brought us back. Nobody could do it. We, it's evident that Noah couldn't do it. Because everybody wiped off the side, off the face of the earth. These eight people survived. All these animals, and the animals act better than the human beings. Yes? We, we're in a bad situation right now. But we have a relationship with God. And throughout your Bible and throughout the conversation of the Christian, sometimes we get relationship and fellowship tied together as one. What's the difference between relationship with God and fellowship with God? Who's talking? There's a difference between relationship and fellowship. What is that difference? There's a difference between salvation and sanctification. What is that difference? Now, these are principles that, that we, we've done, we, we've discussed. Fellowship would be that we come just come to church, to the body, and then we fellowship with song and words from him. Okay, so help me, help me, help me present what you said. Say that again now. Say. I said when you have a relationship with God, that means that you have taken time. You're praying with Him in your private spot, and uh, at home, you're speak talking to the Lord. 
you're praying to the Lord, you're waiting on the answer. And fellowship is when you come into the house of the Lord and you fellowship. Okay, I see. So, so you're saying fellowship is when we fellowship with each other. We have we have both kononia with each other and kononia with God, right? So when we fellowship with each other, that is that is a form of fellowship. But let's talk about the difference between salvation and sanctification, because there's a difference. There's a difference between salvation and sanctification. And when you talk about salvation, salvation is when we use the word relationship. Sanctification is when we use the word fellowship. So we have a relationship with God in the fact that we have salvation. We are born again. Now we have a relationship with God that we never had before. And once you have a relationship with him, through the new birth experience, you will never, ever, ever lose that relationship. Salvation gives us that relationship with him. Somebody ought to be writing that down. Salvation gives us a relationship with God that we can never, ever lose. When you ask a person how many times you've been saved and they hesitate and they start counting, you know that they don't really know even if they are in a relationship with him. Questions or comments? Let's just talk about relationship right now. Salvation brings about a relationship with God that can never be broken. Write this scripture down. John chapter 10, verses 24 through 30, Jesus is talking. John chapter 10, verses 24 through 30, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are saying to Jesus, Jesus, these people obey you. And Jesus saying, you know why? Because my sheep hears my voice and a stranger they won't follow. In other words, they follow me because they are saved. Because they are born again. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep, plural, hear my voice. And my sheep, plural, will not follow anybody else. Yes? yes? He goes on to say, and the reason why others don't hear me is because they're not of me. And then when he looks in verse 24 through 30, he goes on to talk about not only do they hear my voice, they follow me. And he says, they are in my hand. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. They have a relationship with me. Yes. And because they have a relationship with me, they're in the palm of my hand. And the devil in hell cannot take them away from me. Yes. During prison ministry, did you know, brothers study a lot of stuff in prison. In prison ministry, one of the famous questions was that, well, can I give my relationship back? Can I give my salvation back? Well, first of all, you didn't do anything to accomplish it. You didn't do anything to receive it. You trusted what Jesus has already put in you. That's right. You trusted what God has already placed in you. Romans chapter 10 says it like this. God has given to every man a measure of faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, We are saved by, by grace through faith and not of ourselves. We can't brag about it. And because we have grace, that tells me we don't deserve it. And he says by faith or through faith, it tells me the same faith that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 10, we didn't even get that faith on our own. We didn't develop it on our own. It was a gift from God. So even the faith we have, we didn't give it to us. We didn't work for it. So when we have a relationship, Jesus says, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, they cannot be snatched out of my hand. We're in a relationship. Now, I know on social media, they ask about your relationship. You see all, all kinds of things. As complicated as one of them. Single is another. 
I'm in a relationship is another. Even divorce is one that you can check. Or marriage is one you can check. But when you're in a relationship with God, you are tied to God and God is tied to you. And you will never lose that tie. That is your salvation. That is your relationship that you have with God that you will never lose. Question or comments? So when you have that relationship, that's when you accept Christ as your Savior and ask him to come into your heart. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, he comes into your heart and you have a relationship. Right. And guess what? God does not two-time you. Right. Yeah. Everybody know who two-time is? <laughs> Sister Brown, you had your hand up. You, you had that look on your face. <laughs> you were thinking about saying something about relationship and salvation. Well, I look at relationship as being long term, but then when you talk about fellowship, that being short term. But my question is on this, you have it and you never lose it. Mm -hmm. What about those that backslide? Well, that's the next point I want to make. <laughs> when you have a relationship, I, I, my conviction is when you have a relationship, you there from now on. My, my relationship with my mom and daddy is that I'm their son. Whether they own me or not, I'm still their son. Whether I look like them or not, their DNA is still in me. That relationship is com it comes into play because of my DNA. And I can never, ever, ever get rid of that DNA. Ooh, look at God. That, that's a relationship. Now, there have been many, plenty, a plethora of times that I no, no longer was their good son. I was their bad son. I still have a relationship. I'm still I'm still carrying this, the, the title of their son. And because I still I am still their son, they can't get rid of me and I can't get rid of them. Even the celebrities that divorce their parents, they still have the DNA in them. It's a relationship. Now, when you talk about fellowship, here it is, sanctification. And when you talk about fellowship, you have sanctification. It is an ongoing commitment. Sister Brown says it's short term. And for some people, it's shorter term than other terms. Because when you have sanctification, it deals with your actions, your deeds, and your respect toward God. Somebody this week who is still saved, who still have a relationship with God, has broken fellowship. Let's look at Luke chapter 15. Uh, Luke chapter 15, it talks about the fact that there, you may want to write that down because I'm going to run through it right quick. Luke chapter 15 talks about a man who had, a, had 100 sheep. One of the sheep nibbled his way away from the fold. The man, the, the, the sheep herder, the shepherd, he went and found, he left the 99 and went and found that one sheep. If another shepherd would have found his sheep, he still would have been that man's sheep. Another shepherd would have just uh, secured that man's sheep, but it still would have been his sheep. He still had his brand on him. I grew up on a plantation. The man's name was Wayne, Wayne, Wayne King. We called him Wayne King. It really was Wayne King. You know, in the country, you make up names. You make them sound like you talk. His name was Wayne King. W.K. If you look at any of his cows, any of his horses, it had a stamp, a brand on it that my dad and the other men put this brand on him. And the cow would get out of the fence and run over to another pastor. And guess what? That man and the other pastor had to make a decision. Am I going to give this sheep back? Or am I going to put him in the rest of them, with the rest of them and hide him in there? It was still Wayne King's sheep. Wayne King's sheep. 
still his, it was still his cattle. But the man had claimed them as his. And just because the devil claims somebody doesn't mean that we are his. So when you talk about relationship, it's there from now on. And when you black backside, listen to what the word of God says. God is in love with the backslider. God, the God we, we serve is such a merciful God until he's in love with the backslider. When you mess up, and when you talk about backside, I guess you're talking about long term, just walking away from the church, walking away from God, walking away from the preacher, just don't have respect for God. It's backslidden. You're in a backslidden position. That means you pushed your way away from the table. When I went to my parents' house to eat, if I didn't like that, I still ate it. But if I pushed my way away from the table, I'm still their son. If I go over there and I choose not to eat, I'm still their son. I'm in a back, and when I was out there doing the food, and let me tell you, uh, Brother uh, Taylor, I, I've done the food before. And when I was out there doing the fool, I was still their son. I was just their bad son. I still had that relationship intact. Whether my daddy liked it or not. When I came home and my brother told my dad I had been spending the tithes on his car, so he let me know those keys, those tithes, and those cars belong to me. And he reached his hand out. He didn't have to say a mumbling word. I gave him the key. But guess what? I was no longer his driving son. I was still his son. I was, when I came off Roosevelt Street and hit uh, Kinlock Road in, in, the, in that big Buick LeSabre turn and the tail whipped around, let me tell you, I was his bad son. But I was still his son. And if the police had a saw me, he would have taken me right down there into my daddy's house and said, your son was driving recklessly. Now, daddy wouldn't have liked it, but I was still his son. But I had broken relationship. And when you have sanctification, you have fellowship. I'm sorry, fellowship. So it looks like you gotta say something. Don't just shake your head. I thought you were fan and fly like I was. I'm almost 61. <laughs> so, so this is the deal. I still have a relationship, but I have broken fellowship. And when I break fellowship, I'm in a backslidden position, and so I don't get the blessings. After my daddy took the keys, I had to walk. I had to catch the bus. I had to find a way on the other side of the bayou in order to catch the bus. I'm still his son. I'm just his walking son. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's a big thing when you're in high school and you're driving somebody's car. It's a big responsibility. And most of us could not handle. And then when I got to be a senior, I didn't have to show up until three hours after school started and I left two hours before school was out. But when daddy took those keys, I had to hitchhike me a ride to get back home. I broke fellowship. My sanctification wasn't intact. I had put myself in a backslidden position. And just like God is in love with the backslider. Daddy was still loving me, but he was loving me without his keys. And the distance that we put between us and God is distance that we have chosen. God didn't move. Okay, am I clear? Everybody on the same page? You got it? Just kind of, am I answering your question? Or I'm just talking. Yeah. She said, I'm just talking. <laughs> Ask any more questions, any more questions, because the, when, you, when you know that you love the Lord, you show that you love the Lord, you're in fellowship with him. When other folk can see that you love the Lord, and the way they see it is because God is in work, at work. We're talking about a whole book 
of where God is at work. And when you don't seek out God and where he's at work, then you're in a backslidden position. And you don't have to do drugs, prostitution. You don't have to be a cusser. You don't have to be a smoker. You don't have to kill anybody, but you're in a backslidden position. Now somebody needs to ask you a question. What about the killers that say they say? Now we got judge and jury in here. Check this out. Yes, ma'am. We don't know. Right, we don't we know. We aren't gonna know. That's not for our. We don't know their hearts. So and guess what? When we get to heaven, we ain't concerned about it. Right, right. Because when you get to heaven, there ain't gonna be no whitlocks. Mm -hmm. He ain't gonna be mad to her. You better do what's right now. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't gonna matter. A sister Davis ain't gonna own me no more. <laughs> Did that come out right? <laughs> they're, they're, we have to do our best in, in sanctification down here. That's why we, we're Christian. We, we have this relationship with God, and the relationship will never be broken. And, and even when you have those passages in the Bible that says that God will release you to be, to be an infidel, and that kind of thing, you got to consider the context. Jesus says, you're in the palm of my hand. And nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Sister Woods. If you have no salvation, you, can't, you won't have no relationship? If you have no salvation, you have no relationship with God. Without salvation, you have no relationship. The only reason my mama... Answer my phone calls is because I, re I have a relationship. Now, when I was doing the food, she had a choice because I had broken fellowship. And when she had a choice, she can ignore my phone calls all day long. I remember, I remember one time I, I called myself from runway home. Check this out. Indianola, Mississippi may be seven miles square. And when I was there, it was population 1,200 people. Seven miles, let's say seven miles, total, total, from, from one angle to the other, seven square miles. I'm on one way from home, and I'm running to my grandmama house in the same city. Did I run away from home? I just went visiting. <laughs> and when I was gone for a while, I had to go back home and ask mom and dad for some money and mama shut the door. She was like, if I'm gonna take care of you, you might as well be here. And when I went back home, I was crying, Sister Wood, and daddy just sat there and watched me cry. I was pleading my case. He said, not a mumbling word. You wrong? Do what wrong folk do. But check this out. A couple years later, I left home at 17 and I left the right way. The same grandmama, my dad and mama that lived across town, she passed away. My uncle was living by himself, so I went and stayed with him. And guess what? Daddy came over, mama came over, we had a good time. What's the difference? What's the difference? I left the right way. It was a mutual agreement that I could go and stay with my uncle. And I haven't been back home since. Sixteen and a half years old. Stayed with my uncle, went to work out that house, paid my bills in that house, and guess what? Because I was still mom and dad's child, when I graduated from college, they gave me a brand new car. A 1978 Ford Zephyr in 1983. You'll get that by the time you get to the house. They gave me a brand new car. A 1978 Ford Zephyr. They don't even make them anymore. And the year was 1983. 
Daddy, the same daddy that watched me ball and cry and said not a mumming word, I maintained my relationship. I had broken fellowship. When I left that house that time, I broke fellowship. But the same daddy that kept and knew, he kept me and he knew me as his son. After graduation, he stood up under the Coliseum uh, parking lot and he said to me, Here's your, here are your keys. Some three years later. Isn't that awesome? Guess why he did that? Because I have a relationship. I'm his son. And at that time, I was his good son. I was his good son. Now my fellowship is back intact. Now my sanctification is in place when we talk about God. Come on, ask me another question. Let's do it. If I hadn't gone back, I would be in a backslidden position. And with God, that backslider is sinning. Right. Okay. And God has no part of sin. Right. So if he never repents of that sin, he still, you know. I'm still his son but, if I didn't repent. But, but he's not saved if he continues to sin because he said the soul that sinned it shall die. Right, die. There are two types of deaths, right? And when you look at the Greek word for death, one place it talks about physical death, the other place it talks about spiritual death. Now, when Adam messed up in the garden, he gave us both of them. Both of them. We die physically, we die spiritually. Now, and I, if I had not gone back, I could have lived a whole life being my daddy's son, but being in a backslidden position, but I'm still his son. I could have lived my whole life without a re loving relationship from my daddy. I would have been in torture because I didn't have my daddy's blessings. As long as I'm in a backslidden position, and check this out, I wouldn't have had his blessing and I would have felt it, I would have been miserable, and I would have died. And guess what it would have done? If I died, and never came back, he still would have buried me with his money. Why? Because I'm his son. And I, when it comes to God, if I'm saved, if I'm born again, I mean, I am for sure born again. I received Jesus. I trust him as my savior. I'm in a backslidden position. What happens when I die, I still go to heaven, but my rewards are cut short. That's the homework assignment for a week after next Homework assignment. <laughs> Homework assignment is how do we get our rewards cut? And is it true? You know, is what I'm saying is true? Do we get our rewards cut based on our deeds? Because we're talking about deeds, right? When we're in bachelor position, we're not doing the right thing. Our deeds. Are we going to be judged by our deeds? Second part of the homework assignment, because you got two weeks to do it. Second part, what is the difference? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ and who goes before the great white throne? Now, I want y'all to do this homework and bring it back. You got two weeks to do it. Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ, known as the Bema seat? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ and who goes before the great white throne? Because all of us are going to be judged, right? We're going to be judged based on the things done in this life. Whether it's good or bad, right or wrong, we're going to be judged on it. There's going to be a judgment before the judgment seat of Christ, and there's going to be a judgment before the great white throne. Which two groups go in either way? Which group goes before the great white throne? Which group goes before the judgment seat of Christ? So if I die, I'm still my daddy's child. I still have a relationship. If I die, I'm still God's child. I still go to heaven if I die. Because guess what, y'all? Everybody in this room is going to die with some unconfessed sin. Yes? You know why? Because we can't detect all of them. Even the thoughts in your mind. We're going to die with something messed up. You know why? The second reason is because we don't know when we're going to die. 
That's why people, when they have the deathbed confessions, they say, Lord, forgive me for all the sins I've ever committed. They try to get it all in. But when we die, we're going to die with some sin that we've done that's unconfessed. So it's not the confession get, that gets us in there, it's Jesus that puts us in there. And you know, like the, the author talks about, talks about the fact that that uh, God is at work all around us. We got to join God where he's at work. And we got to make sure that we are great servants unto the Lord. And of course, we're going to talk about this in two weeks, right? So, so we got to make sure that we are servants of the Lord. The servant is the one who, um, who serves others, who's the greatest. That's the one who's the greatest, the servant. But what we have to understand is our service unto the Lord can't pay our way into heaven. Our deeds cannot pay our way into heaven. And then this is the next question. If we can lose our salvation, how do you determine when you lose it? How, do one, how does one know when he loses that salvation? Some people in the church would say, because she's a prostitute, she lost it. Some people in the church would say, because they're drug addicts, they lost it. Some people would say because they got that there in sin and never made it back in, they lost it. But let me bless you for your loved ones' sake, the ones who died out there. Some people died in gunshot wounds because they were in gangs. If they knew the Lord as their Savior, they still went to hell. Yes, they still. And you know, we often wonder, did my loved one go to heaven? Number, number one, Sister Whitlock's right. She says that we will never know who's saved. Because there are some folks that work in the church that are not saved. I thank God that the leadership of our church, the people who work in our church are born again. How you know? Because of who they are and the way they act. Because we don't we don't do good deeds to be born again. We do good deeds because we are born again. Brother Taylor, you had something? Right. I, I talked and you forgot. No, no, no. Okay, so, so we have to understand that, that God sets the standard. We don't. Because if we would set the standard, if somebody killed our loved one, that person wouldn't go to heaven. We would make sure that that person didn't go to heaven. Have you noticed some parents, they go every time a person gets up for parole that killed one of their children, they go to court and testify against that person for 20 years. For 20 years, they go over and over again, make sure my responsibility to make sure he rots in hell and he rots in jail. But the fact of the matter is, if he saved, Jeffrey Dahmer went to heaven. If he saved Manson, go to heaven. Charles Manson. I know it's not the way we see it, but God is the final judge. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Your, your first question was, how do we get our what reward? How do we gain or we miss our rewards? Now, I want homework assignments. Turn in two weeks from now. Homework assignments. Two weeks from now, I want those assignments in or y'all all gonna get else. <laughs> I want them in. <laughs> three weeks from now, you got three whole weeks. Trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> three weeks from now, you got three weeks. And the, the, the third assignment is to read day three in completion and day four and do the assignments in day three and day four. And that will finish up that, that unit, okay? Days three, days four, oh, well, we got five. Days three, day four, and day five. You got three weeks. You do day you do day three this coming week, day four next week, and day five the following week. 
Yes? Why y'all looking at me like that? Question. Question. Are you here next week, Wednesday? Next Wednesday, we all will be at the Bethel Standard Church for the mission, for the mission commissioning. There will be no Bible study at the New Beginning Church. Our Bible study will begin at 7 p.m. at Bethel's Family Church. So that's one week. That's on the 8th? That's the 10th. April 10th. Oh, the 10th. April 10th. The following week mm -hmm. is the 15th. The 17th. The 17th. Brother Miles will be our teacher on the 17th. He won't cover my material. He's going to cover his own material. Yes? So the 17th, Brother Miles will be our teacher. And I will be listening and posting and I will be sharing. So that gives you three whole weeks. Yes? We'll, we'll, we'll tell you how it happens next week. Okay? We'll tell you how it happens next week. Okay, so, so we got this week is the third. Yes? The following week is the 10th. We will be at the Bethel Family Church for a mission commissioning. Okay? So I'm going on a foreign mission. You all gonna come over there and send me off. That's April 10th. That's next Wednesday. There will be no Bible study at the New Beginning Church, no choir rehearsal at New Beginning Church. We will have Bible study on April the 10th at Bethel Family Church. It starts at 7 p.m. Yes. Okay. Bethel Family Church on uh, Fun Meadow and Sandpiper. Fun Meadow, Southwest Houston, Fun Meadow and Sandpiper, April 10th. We will be there. Okay? Yes, sir. Everybody with me? Yes, sir. The 17th, we will be back here. Well, you will be back here because I will be on foreign missions, correct? Mm -hmm. The 17th, Brother Miles will teach the Sunday school. I mean, teach the Bible study lesson. The following week, if my math is correct, the 21st, 20, 24. 24th, we're going to start day three, unit one, back here at the New Beginning Church, Experiencing God, page 17. Day three, unit one, page 17, and you're going to have all that studied up all the way to page number 29. Because you're gonna continue your days during these weeks that we are we're, that I'm not here. Okay. So you can mark in your book when you're gonna study that area. Okay. So where we're gonna be next week, April 10th? Where we're gonna be? Bethel Family. Family Church for the commissioning and Bible study of the missionaries, the farm missionaries. I'm included. You're gonna be there to make sure that you send me off in prayer. Praise, worship at the Bethel Family Church Bible study. Okay. The following week is the 17th. Yes? Yes. Brother Miles will be here. You will be here at the New Beginning Church. Yes, sir. And you will be in Bible study at the New Beginning Church at 715. If you're not in your seat at 715, you late. Yes, sir. And you owe the church $10 <laughs> if you late. I'd rather you get here early so we can make a sandwich. Okay? okay. So the 24th, I'll be back and we're going to start on day three of unit one. Unit three. Unit one. Unit one. Everybody with me? Questions or comments? Am I wrong? Am I delusional? Everybody's good. What are the three assignments you have? What's the first assignment? How do we get our rewards cut okay. based on our deeds? How do we receive our rewards or how are our rewards cut off? As Christians, how do we get our rewards? How does anybody get their rewards cut? What's the second assignment? Or how do you gain them? What's the second assignment? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ and who goes before the great white throne. Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of seat, and who goes before the great white throne? 
and you cannot ask Pastor Watson. Okay? What's the third assignment? Study and do the homework assignments for days three, four, and five. Unit one. Everybody has it? Oh, really? That's what I wrote down. Okay, how does one, I thought there was a question that no one answered, but that's a good one. How does one know when he or she loses, if he or she loses their salvation? That's the homework assignment. Okay. So that's four assignments, right? Four assignments in three weeks. How does one know when he or she loses his, his or her salvation, if it is possible? Okay. Yes? I want y'all to be seminarians and researchers. Okay. Amen? Amen? And you can't just tell me, yes, you can lose it. You can't just tell me, no, you can't lose it. You have to support it with Scripture. Everything we do must be supported with, with Scripture. Yes, sir. Yes? Yes. Amen. There may be somebody present that have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior. The door of the church is open. You can come to Jesus as you are. You just must believe the story that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose from the dead. If you never received him as your savior, just bow your head with me and you can receive him right now. Just re repeat this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sin, you are born again, you are saved, and you are on your way to heaven. One other announcement other than April the 10th, we will be at Bethel Family. The other announcement, Saturday, this Saturday, April the 6th, the children and their parents have decided to do one more garage sale. It will be at the home of one of our members. And I will give you the address as soon as I get it. That's this Saturday. We need helpers there at 6 a.m. to uh, help our children um, with their garage sale. It will be in Pasadena, I mean, in Pearland, Texas. Pearland, Texas. So I will get the address to you as soon as I receive it. We need everybody there at 6 a.m. Amen? While we stand to, to be dismissed, are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise reports. Prayer requests or praise reports. Glad to see Pastor Watson with us. Thank you for coming by and being, being a part, being a part of our service. You cannot ask Pastor Watson to help you with your homework assignment. No, not one, no, not, not one. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you, Father God, that you are such a great God. You are merciful. God, you are the God who keeps us and blesses us. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are at work all around us. Lord, help us to join you when you are at work. Bless us to look for ways to join you. Lord, that your will will be done and not ours. Bless our lives to be turned toward you and our hearts to be turned toward you. That we, Father God, will benefit from the joy of Kananiah, the joy of the great fellowship, the love relationship that we have with you and with each other. Now, Lord, we ask you to dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. If you want to give uh, electronically to the New Beginning Church, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. 
listing.jesus at yahoo.com or you can give my mailing in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. God bless you and keep you. Desire.